Whoop, right. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here uh, to give you a little address. I'd like to acknowledge the um, sovereign custodians of this country where you fellows have got your rear end sitting on. Uh, and uh, also a big thank you to, to Gary and Maury and uh, Charlene for getting me here. Pretty hard to get me out of the bush these days. Uh, anyway, we're down here in the big city and last time I was here, it was a memorial for an old, old man that um, sort of changed things in Australia, the old Prime Minister. So they wanted me to talk today about um, um, my sort of background and how I actually got into education and whatnot. So I thought, well, you know, I'll do a bit of, bit of a biography on me. Um, some parts are in interesting, some are pretty bloody boring. But uh, my grandmother is from Bunjalung country, which is that northern New South Wales uh, on the Aboriginal side. My uh, grandfather was born in the bush before the turn of the 20th century, Lama Lama country, right up on Cape York, crocodile country, uh, Lakefield National Park. And um, you know, uh, my other side, of course, is Irish. So I got the bloody best of both worlds, my friend. Yeah, oppression on bloody both sides. But, you know, we overcome it, and we did it, a lot of it through the oral, oral tradition. So I was born in Cairns. Mum and Dad went back as far as they could away from the big, big smoke to get married. Uh, and uh, we moved down to southern Queensland when I was about four years old. And uh, we had a little block of land there out on the western Darling Downs that we used as a uh, staging place for the droving horses and a few milking cows and stuff. And I was on a horse when I was age four, uh, which was great because, uh, you know, um, I suppose when I look back on it, that was the basis of, of my being, I suppose, in some ways, was campfires and the night sky and listening to stories. And uh, it was a horse here, and uh, we had these funny little things that when I look back, you know, as a teenager, it made sense, but we were told that if we ever heard a motor vehicle, uh, we had to go and hide. We thought it was a bit of a game, you know, we never got many motor vehicles, but um, it was a time when I was taking the kids away, and uh, we thought it was just a game. So you could hear a bloody car or a vehicle miles away, and we'd run and hide in the bush. And then I often wondered why Daddy put a great big flaming, it was about three mile into our, our little hut, we had a dirt floor hut, he put a big old truck tire up and he put the name of the property and he put a big arrow facing where you had to go, the dead opposite way. So if any bugger come in, they'd be going that way. But it was all to save us as kids. Uh, and the, the, the big thing, you know, our, uh, I suppose being drovers, you were moving all the time. And uh, Dad, um, uh, we had pack horses with everything on the pack horses and Mum had a sulky with my little brother who was nine months old when I was four and uh, he was on the back of the sulky in a little box. And that's the way we used to travel until we got a horse. But our big contact to the outside world was uh, this new invention of technology called a radio. We had an old dry cell battery radio that um, you know, you put an aerial up a tree to get the signal and you get the ABC. And as I was saying at the concert last night, we got um, this stuff called Hillbilly Music in the morning, which was all old Tex Morton sort of stuff and that. And then uh, in the evening you get this gorgeous classical music. Uh, and you know, these, our, a lot of our mob were illiterate, around the campfire talking and that. And uh, you'd get, I remember, really, really, uh, so well that under milk wood being read in about 1952, you know, because it was a, a word uh, radio play. And our mob, like, discussing it like it was a university tutorial, you know. By God, that, <laughs> you know, that polygata, you go watch out for that one. I mean, watch that one. Nat Butcher Bainan, yeah, he put Cat and Dog at his meet that fella. And that willy nilly postman, he, 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 he opens letters up, that fella. It was just amazing, that oral tradition coming through. Uh, Mum, of course, tried correspondence uh, to get us educated. But as soon as we heard the bloody, uh, the horses coming in, we were gone. So poor old Mum never had a, a chance, uh, really, and being moving all the time, getting the correspondence to a certain place. We didn't know where we were the next week. 
Uh, so I actually wound up at school about, a, about 10 year old with a bit of a official uh, prodding, as it were. I won't tell you the full story, but anyway, I wound up at, at school. And uh, this whole business of coming from an oral tradition uh, into this written tradition and then being this big flaming kid sitting in grade one, it fitted their stereotypes perfect. He was a big live black fella who was dumb because he couldn't read. And I got the dunce's cap and boy, they spent a lot of their time with their strategy them days was putting the knowledge and information in through your bloody rear end. Man, the cane, the cane, the cane, that's all I was on. And everything was rote learning, the cat sat on the mat. And uh, I suppose, you know, uh, it was that, that particular time that I, I looked at this whole, the society they were putting us into, these little square boxes that we had to sit in as, as kids to learn and stuff. And I felt that there was no relevance to me for education at all because I had skills that they didn't have. They couldn't survive in the bloody bush. No way they could find water. They couldn't track a bloody, you know, a, a flaming cow or, or a horse that was lost. We had skills that they didn't have and I didn't see any reason for education. Anyway, I, I kept going through the system and, you know, they kept shoving me up the grades and I was just making it each time because I was trying to catch up. But then again, sport helped. They found out that I could, I could run, run pretty fast and I could jump pretty high and I wasn't too bad at football. I could whack a ball around the thing with a, with a, with a cricket bat. So sport sort of helped us through. But when you actually look back at the, the sort of the, uh, <coughs> the stuff they used to, we used to have to put up with at this so-called school, I remember there was a, you know, a fair few number of times that we got two buttered lumps of bread with a lump of lettuce. That was our, our dinner. Oh, thanks, mate. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, that, 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 that were, you know, times that I, I, when I felt education did, didn't suit me at all. Uh, and um, high school, of course. I got into high school because, again, sport. So you grab him, put him in here, and he's pretty good at sport, so we'll, we'll yeah, put up with him sort of thing. And I remember the master of studies, he was called the master of studies, uh, come and said to me, look, your comedy, your best... Uh, profession would be to follow exactly what your parents are doing, which is droving. And so I said, yeah, right, I'm out of here. So I left school uh, at about 16 and went back to, to what uh, mum and dad w were doing. And them days, of course, there was heaps and heaps of jobs, labour and jobs. If you had a strong back, you got jobs. Wool pressing, stick picking, you know, bag lumping uh, on your back, uh, wool pressing, uh, cane cutting, stuff like that. We had, you know, work every day of the flaming year, but then mechanisation came in in the, in the mid-50s, big time. So it cut all those labouring jobs out virtually. So that we had to reskill ourselves, and we didn't have courses to reskill re yourselves these days. They just threw you in the bloody deep end and said, you're a silo operator. So if you stuffed it, that was your fault. So you learnt really quick. Same in the welding sheds, right, there's the welding stick, pull your amps out, start welding. If you bomb it, well, you don't get the job. Uh, and th it was this process through my early life of just reskilling all the time. And it forced us from that um, sort of um, contracting job into these, um, uh, you know, uh, shed type jobs. Anyway, I, uh, you know, sort of uh, got into the welding pretty well and, um, you know, did all right for a while, and but I was never satisfied with watching TV, so uh, I went and um, studied. I just loved the sound. Of, I loved the concept of sound and how sound was put together. Uh, and uh, I studied classical music theory and um, of a night time. And, um, you know, I, I got right into it. Um, and I got to a point where my old teacher said to me, she said, you're at an, um, uh, a standard that's miles ahead of what this DDIAE is, um, you know, um, requires for, for, for the entrance into the music course. So I ripped on the motorbike and the overalls and ripped out to the to music thing and had a little audition and they said to me, well, we'd love to have you, but we don't have a classical guitar um, 
uh, teacher of the standard that we require. So uh, you do this thing called history and this thing called geography, and um, you can take music as, as a third of your course. And I thought, oh, well, anything's better than bloody well than shed. Yep, so <laughs> out I goes, uh, orientation week, first day. They put me on probo for 12 months. So first day, I goes up to the library, and I didn't know, I've never been, in, never been in the library. I didn't know how to get a book out of the library. So I thought, well, if I go and tell the lecturers that, I, I, they'll, they'll think I'm dumb and I'm out the bloody door again. So I went over to the big, big section where, the big reference section where they had the, the, the big Oxford dictionaries and that, you know, 26 volumes of the Oxford dictionary. I pulled the biggest book out I could, and it happened to be D, by the way, the D section, and I put it out, and I watched how they got a bloody book out of the library. This fellow comes in, he goes over there to those little things, and he pulls little bloody drawers out, and that's got A on it. And I said, oh, mate, what are you looking for? And he, oh, I'm, I'm looking for whatever. Oh, okay, and then you go down the aisle where the number is, and then along there, and you'll find your, oh, shit, I found out how to get a book out of the library. But while I was in there, in this D book, I looked up democracy in the Oxford Dictionary. And there was three criteria in it that I actually remembered, you know. Uh, yeah, tolerance of minorities, uh, government by all the people, not 51%, the bloody lot, all the people, and absence of hereditary class distinctions. And they were real big words for me, but I thought, shit, that's good. Tolerance of minorities, shit, we're a minority. And, and you know, yeah, government by all the people. And that means that Granny Lizzie and, and, and them mobbing the royalty and the moneyed men can't pass the money to the next generation. I thought, that's a great definition of democracy. That's the first thing I learned at uni. Anyway, so I got through, uh, into uni and, um, uh, well, it was really funny. I'll tell you a story. At Walsh's Engineer in this huge bloody welding works that we worked at, uh, we used to throw all our scrap metal into a 200 litre steel bloody drums, all the leftover scrap. And when I went to the university, I was walking in behind the visual arts and the, the mob and noticed he's the same drums full of this steel. And then I realised what was going on. The sculpture students are using that scrap metal that we're pegging away to make art out of. And of course they couldn't weld. And when they found out I could weld, I used to do the welding for them and they got marked on their welding. <laughs> I never got no bloody marks for it, but they did. <laughs> yeah, but it was just all this concept, but the other thing I found at uni was, holy mackerel, the amount of knowledge that was there. Once I found all these books, God, I read everything, everything I could get my hands on. Uh, you, you name it, I was reading it. Uh, and it opened up this whole new world, which to me was, was something really big because the only thing I could get, I tried to get apprenticeships, you know, in, in fitting and turning and, and um, boiler making and stuff, but they wouldn't give it to me. I think there was a little racist bias there, of course. And the other fact was that I was in there, you know, you, you, you get a bit unionised, of course. One of the big things when I was 16 year old, when I first got out of school, um, went wool pressing. And um, I was working for this cocky. And um, he had me mustering the sheep in of a morning, doing the wool pressing of a, of a daytime, and then marking the sheep, putting the rattle on them, and taking them out in the paddock two mile after the shed had finished for the day. So I was doing morning work, mustering in, and then taking them out. I remember the second day, the old uh, boss here, old Billy, Billy Mitchell, he said, Kev, are you getting paid to bring the, the sheep in, muster them in the morning, and take the buggers out of an, uh, an evening? And I said, no, I think it's all in the contract. He said, nah, -uh, nah. -uh. He said, you, you're, we're contracted here in the shed as a union uh, to do the union work. If he wants you to do that, he's got to pay you extra. And I'm only a 16-year-old young fella. And I said, oh, well, yeah. I'm, he said, you're signed on in the shed and you're part of the union. I said, yeah, bloody oath. Anyway, next morning at Smoko, old Billy pulls the bloody, this bloody boss up, this cocky up, and says, you paying Kev to go out to, to muster and that and must take him out after the work? He said, oh, it's a private agreement between me and Kev. 
And old Billy said, no, no, it's not, mate. <laughs> no way. He said, unless you pay him extra for that, he said, uh, that's the last sheep you're going to get bloody shorn here. And funny thing, I got paid. And I thought, wow, this is, this is bloody unionism, mate. <laughs> My oath. <laughs> uh, yeah, just, j just that, that really cemented me. And the same thing with cane cutting. Uh, I was cutting, I did, actually did the last hand cut of cane at, uh, for the, the Nambour Mill. And when we were working for this old fellow, he was mad, poor bugger. Uh, and uh, they got what they called standover cane. If it rains too much uh, one year and they can't cut that cane, it, sta it stands over to the next year. And of course, it doesn't stand up bloody straight, mate. It falls over and it's bloody, it, it entangles itself and it's extremely bloody hard to cut. Because when you've got it in rows, you just cut two up, one back, and throw the heads the one way, whack the heads off with a topper knife. It's all nice, it's all nice and straight, but stand over cane, pain in the bum. Anyway, this bloody old dickhead, I'm sorry, it, this, this, this uh, employee, <laughs> boy, uh, he kept burning, every Sunday night they'd burn, he kept burning the bloody standover cane. And it's an agreement in, with the union that you, 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 you cut one week standover cane and one week good cane so that you've got a bit of each so you can get a decent run. He kept burning this bloody standover cane every week. And I remember Alfie uh, Humphreys, he was a, he was a bloody ganger, uh, we confronted him about it, and of course this old fellow said, oh, you know, um, it's not my fault, we've got to get the stuff cut, and, you know, Alfie said, here's the bloody agreement. He said, all right, if you don't like it, you can piss off. Oh, we said, yeah, Alfie said, right -o. He said, the boss, this cocky said, they're my water bags by law. And Alfie picks up the water bags with a cane on, and he goes, whack. He said, yep, you can have them, mate. He said, and they're my files. I got to supply you with files. And Alfie picks up the files and goes, whoa, you can have them. And poor buggy, he never got his cane cut at all. But again, standing up for your flame and rights, it was, uh, it went, you know, it certainly stuck with me right through my life. Gee, time's getting on, Maury. Nearly 20 minutes. These, these buggers are bored stiff already. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. Well, let, I'm, I'm just going to zoom right through to the uh, Bajelki Peterson era. Anybody here that comes from Queensland? Oh, one, one hand, two. My God. Well, you fellas need an education. You need an... It was something else, mate. It was, yeah, the old peanut farmer, he was something else, believe me. Um, he, um, <clears throat> I was at the... You know, we used to have little protests and stuff, eh? And they'd, um, because he passed this stupid law. It said three people into one place at the one time constituted an illegal assembly. It's bloody absurd, isn't it? Like us with families shopping of a Saturday morning. Get real? Anyway, you have a little protest, so you had to go single file, one behind the other, take the kids down the footpath, uh, and, and then we'd have a little protest in the park, because that was a public place. Uh, the council would uh, refuse to turn the electricity on for our PA, so we had a few little hiccups on, on the way. But they'd ring, ring you up and say, well, Kev, uh, we've got a protest on, bring the guitar down and, uh, you know, sing a song. And I wouldn't have flame and time to, um, to, to make the whole song up, so I'd just get something like, uh, which side are you on, which was written by a woman from the mining uh, Appalachian mountain country. And you say, which side are you on, my friends? Which side are you on? Which side are you on, my friends? Which side are you on? They say that up in Queensland, the union bashing's bad. I'd rather be a union friend than a National Party scab. Well, and which side are you on, my friend? Yeah, but we were very, yeah. <laughs> But we were extremely well protected. There was about 30 or 40 of us, you know, single mums, <laughs> black fellas, you name it. And we had about 40 or 50 policemen. Yeah, and I, oh yeah, they used to be protecting us. You see, every bloody week when I got on the motorbike to go to the well and shed, I had a lady policeman. She was very concerned about my safety. Pull me up. Checked me tyres, 
check me blinkers, check me headlights, make sure my helmet was on. Yeah, about twice a week. Yeah, she was very caring, that, that, that woman policeman. <laughs> Bloody mad. It was mad, mad. Anyway, I had an old friend too, because, uh, you know, they had the thing up there called a special branch. That, that made us special people, you see, that they was observing. They did sit in the unmarked cars in unmarked uniforms, no, but you, you, you never knew they were policemen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they turn up in our protests, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger mob with the T-shirt, I love green leaves and that on it. Turn up at our meetings and all that. Uh, yeah, so it, it, was, it was a bit of a weird time. Uh, I never had a phone for 10 years because I just got jack of being bloody tapped. Uh, but some of the, the, the weird things that people uh, could sort of do. Uh, I had an old friend who was a carpenter. And, um, he, uh, he made up a stencil. He used to live just down the range in a little log cabin because it was a place called Toowoomba, which was uh, four National Party electorates used to um, join in Toowoomba. And just down the range, he used to live in his little log cabin and he, he built as a carpenter. He used to ride a push bike. And what he did was he made up a stencil, a beautiful stencil out of steel that spelt J-O-H. And he put it in his little bag uh, with a can of spray paint. <clears throat> and two o'clock in the morning, away he go around Toowoomba. And there wasn't too many stop signs in Toowoomba them days. And under each stop sign, he just went pshht. <laughs> on to the next stop sign, pshht. Yeah, like people found all different ways to sort of confront this bloody absurdity. And, uh, you know, like, that, like John Dengate wrote, wrote that song, Morier, uh, the song called Kanamala. Again, took a, a tune that everybody knew, and it's a long way to Kanamala, it's a long way to go, long way to Kanamala, on the river Wari go. We know there's been a gerrymander, and we know that it ain't fair, but we have to rely on Kanamala. They vote for me there. Well, Mr. Bajelki Peterson, he's a genius, it's true. Mr. Bajelki Peterson can turn six votes into two. He bloody did. So look, I gotta stop saying that word. <laughs> It's a nice word though, you know. But that's right, out there in, in, in the National Party electorate, 9,000 people could vote one person in the parliament. Down in Tommy Burns' electorate, down Murray and around the, the, the Bay Area in Brisbane, it took 32,000 to vote the same one person in. And then we had old Russ Hinge, you know, he, old Russ, oh boy. He was the minister for everything. Unbelievable, unflaming believable. Um, and I, I, oh, I remember, yeah. the day that Gossie finally got in, it was unbelievable. I thought, this is going to go on for bloody ever. Uh, but the, the protest was something else. It brought people together, and it gradually grew. It took so long, but it gradually flamed and grew. Um, the other, other thing is, I'll, I'll just give you another one too. Uh, Maury likes this song. It's called Midnight Special. It was done by a, a fellow called old Udi Ledbetter. And, um, you know, again, I didn't have time to put uh, a, a tune to it, so I just got the song and put, uh, if you ever go to Queensland, you better walk right wing. You better not gamble. You better not fight the system. Commissioner Lewis will arrest you, and they'll verbal you on down. Next thing you know, my friend, you bugger old jail bound, so let the midnight special shine a light on us. Let the midnight special tell the system to get stuffed. Stuffed, stuffed is the word, stuffed. <laughs> but it was just funny. You just see the policemen that were guarding us would just bristle a little bit because Commissioner Lewis had been mentioned in the song. <laughs> yeah, he got 14 years afterwards, old Commissioner Lewis, but he only did seven. They never got Peterson. Uh, anyway, the, the thing is that uh, I got, got through the education sort of thing and, and got into the, um, uh, did, a, did, did a degree in, in, in education. And uh, Gary was one year behind me. 
See, and me being a, the dumb, dumb person I was told that in primary school and that, I took conspicuously a really lot of notes, really fine notes every lecture. We had nine bloody units for 12 months. It was full on. I took all the notes, took all the notes, and he was a year behind me. He got A's and I got B's because I give him my notes. <laughs> <laughs> So you got somebody with a bit of brains running your place, mate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what was it? Uh, oh, yeah, okay. I got to Queensland Uni, spent half my time, more than half my time, with uh, a few of the other uh, 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 Murray students that had, had degrees, setting up the black unit, trying to convince the bloody academic board, it took us three years, that we needed some uh, infrastructure to keep our mob in there when they got there. And we, we, we finally got the black unit set up. Uh, and then, of course, we had the attempt to close down Triple Z, the, the community radio station. Uh, that was another thing, because we, we, we used to do a hell of a lot of uh, communicating with the, with the community through the Triple, Triple Z radio station. And they tried to close it down. They came through the bloody door. We boarded the doors up when they come in. And they, yeah, they come in with fire axes and... They cut the cables so we couldn't broadcast our, our, our propaganda and our communist propaganda it was. Not just propaganda, it was communist, see. So what we did was we put a caravan right up on the top of Mount Cuthan and we still got our signal out. Yeah. And uh, oh, the other thing too, you, uh, people have always asked me, is it true? Uh, I did a, they put me uh, in, into an in honours degree and then you know, got through that, I did pretty good. And so they put me into master's degree. And then they wouldn't let me do uh, a research masters. I had to go right through the thing, and I reckon there's a bit of racism there. I had to do the, the, the coursework masters. Then they put me into research masters. And I had the damn thing almost finished. And them times, it wasn't the computers like these days. You had to, I had it all handwritten. I had five chapters flaming approved by my supervisor. I had the sixth chapter just about finished and the conclusion, that's all I had to do. And I, the family wouldn't move down to Brisbane, so I was, they were living in Toowoomba. So the old motorbike, I used to run between the two. And uh, I'm boring down there 11 o'clock one night going down to Brisbane and on the old bike. And I thought, geez, it's a bit, bit of wind. It must be a bit of wind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to the research centre where I was squatting. As a postgraduate student, they give me a room in this house, this old university house. But it had a bath and it had a shower and everything. And I just chucked a mattress on the floor and squatted there and, uh, for a couple of years. When I got down there, I found that the bag I had my thesis in uh, it was, had bungee cords around it. She dropped off the back of the bike, but it dragged. And it dragged for about 25 miles. So I got the kids in the old Land Rover, went back, picked all the pieces up in, 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 in plastic bags, uh, shopping bags, and took it back to the research centre where I was squatting. Called my supervisor over and said, well, there's a the thesis. And he said, oh, my God. He said, oh, you've just about bloody finished it. See, because you had to get it typed up them days. And that was it. She's gone. He said, I've heard every, every excuse in my life. My grandmother is extremely sick. My mother's just broke her leg. My father's just had a car accident. I've just broken my leg. But I've never seen anything like this. I said, well, there's the evidence, mate. You're a historian. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so I cleared off back out to scrub and worked with my brother for 12 months. And they took me back and said, oh, you start this thing called a PhD. Anyway, look, I've talked too long. I just like to say that, like, education... To me, it opened up so much, uh, uh, you know, and allowed me to actually become part of this society and to contribute. Once I learned all the isms and all the ologies, I had no idea what they were talking about. It was a different language. Once I learned all that, I could actually start communicating with them. And uh, I'd like to thank all you mob and congratulate you as teachers. Uh, it's, it's the most important job. Uh, it's a lot more important than that fellow with the bad ears that's running the parliament. I'm not going to name names, but yeah. The mad monk, the mad monk. <laughs>